to extend warm welcome to all those who are joining us for the Invest Barbados Forum on Renewable Energy Investment Opportunities in Barbados. I want to thank all of you for joining us, um, those from here in Barbados and those from around the world. We really want to encourage you to lock on. Um, we have some very um, important information for you, some detailed information for you so that you can really get a good grasp of what you need to do and the steps that you need to take to invest in renewable energy in Barbados. And this morning we have a very exciting um, cast for you. And uh, we have Kay Brathwick, who is coming to you as the CEO of Invest Barbados. We also have uh, Brian Haynes, representing the Ministry of Energy. Um, we also have Hayden Rogers, who is representing the Renewable Energy Association here in Barbados. And also we have Robert Yearwood, and he is representative for Barbados Light and Power. And then finally, we also have uh, Joanna Edgel, Director of Mega Power. So we have a very exciting cast of persons who will be bringing to you different perspectives and helping us to really drill down into what we need to practically do to make this today. So before I go any further, I would like to introduce Kay Brathwit. And Kay Brathwit is, as I mentioned before, she is currently the CEO of uh, Invest Barbados. Um, Kay Brathwit has joined the team there at Invest Barbados in September 2019. And Kay Brathwit holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics and Accounting, as well as a Master's of Science in Business and financial economics. An economist by training, she works as a senior economist in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs until 2007. And desirous of learning all aspects of business and finance, she then entered the world of banking and credit. I therefore want to introduce you, Kay Braffitt, the CEO of Invest Barbados. Thank you. Uh, moderator, speakers, members of the media, everyone joining us. On behalf of Invest Barbados and the government of Barbados, welcome to this webinar. Thank you for being part of this one hour exploration into the investment opportunities that can be found within the renewable energy sector of Barbados. Our government with great confidence have set 2030 as the year when the country will be generating 100% of its energy from renewable energy sources. Yes, I said 2030. These sources include solar, wind, biomass, tidal, ocean thermal energy generation, all possible on a tropical island like Barbados. The aim as cited by the responsible ministry is an energy secure nation with a sustainable, vibrant, and innovative energy sector. Very ambitious. And why such an ambitious goal? Barbados is promoting sustainable energy practices on both the supply and demand side. We are embracing energy efficiency and conservation to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and enhance security and sustainability in energy supply improve our competitiveness and achieve greater environmental sustainability. Additionally, as we seek to diversify our economy, we acknowledge this sector's potential to attract foreign direct investment. Several local companies now operate within this sector. You will hear this morning the mega power story and there continues to be keen international interest, hence our very global gathering today. Opportunities include investments in renewable energy systems, energy storage, energy saving devices. Rewards include a range of incentives and a cadre of local professionals. Tertiary training in photovoltaic installation and maintenance is available as deemed critical to the development of the sector. 
recently ranked second for competitiveness among the Latin American and Caribbean countries by the Global Financial Centers Index. Barbados remains a resilient global finance center. Out of 114 countries, including regions of Asia, Europe, the Middle East, North America, Barbados ranked 64th overall. Ranking was based on business environment, human capital, infrastructure, financial sector development, and reputation. I share this achievement to underscore that we have built a stable environment underpinned by transparency and compliance. We continue to offer a warm and welcoming investment climate where innovation can flourish and businesses can grow. In closing, I offer a reminder that investment in this particular sector is an investment in our collective future. And you are invited to discover what Barbados has to offer. My thanks to our speakers today for being your guides on our teams at Invest Barbados is available to you anytime thereafter. So without further ado, over to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Kay. That was a very um, comprehensive overview of where Barbados is going for 2030. And we're gonna get there, and we're gonna get there in an innovative way, in a, in a very comprehensive, creative way going forward. So right now, as we go forward, um, just again, just want to remind you, my name is Mark Hill. I'm also the CEO designate of uh, BADC. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do today is to just keep this uh, forum as practical as possible so that you can get those key questions that you have at the back of your head answered concerning um, the, where we're going with our renewable energy sector in Barbados. So right now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, his name is Mr. Brian Hands, and he's the Chief Project Analyst, Ministry of Energy, Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Mr. Brian Hands studied at the University of the West Indies Cahill Campus, where he attained a first degree, a double major in economics and management in 1996. He continues his studies at the uh, Perito Watts University in Edinburgh, Scotland, where he completed an MBA with specialization in finance in 2006. And since then, Brian has been working very hard in the whole renewable energy space and primarily functioning as the economist, shaping the whole um, unfolding of this sector. So right now, Brian Haynes, over to you um, with your presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I would like to welcome all um, persons from Barbados and around the world. Um, the, the movement towards renewable energy is an exciting one and it's a, a challenging one. And in this business of research and, and planning, challenges always abound. Right? So the Overall vision of the Barbados National Energy Policy 2019 to 2030 is the is energy security and affordability through diversity and collaboration. Collaboration is very important in this in this uh, in this vision statement. Establishing and maintaining a sustainable energy sector for Barbados. Now, this vision, um, while we say, yes, we are going towards 100% carbon neutral, the vision tells us the quality of energy sector that we are looking at in the future and how we intend to get there. And key words there are diversity, collaboration, sustainability, and also energy security. So that gives you the picture of the type of energy sector that we are looking at by 2030. The government of Barbados and the energy sector um, aspire or even are trying to make sure that we attain on our way there. Um, as you mentioned, they range from diversity to efficiency and efficiency is a very important one in that efficiency, a dollar earned um, a dollar saved, sorry, in the renewable energy and energy space 
from fossil fuel means between six to eight dollars earned to the Barbados economy. So it is a very critical aspect um, in the in the whole process. Um, affordability, we want to make sure that uh, we can move energy costs to as um, affordable as possible. Um, reliability, we must ensure that we maintain the reliability in the electricity sector, as well as the energy for the transport sector as we move towards renewable energy. Of course, with developing the sector, it is, be all, it is always important that we make sure that we have a cadre of persons that can sustain it and therefore the, developing the, the, the human resources within the sector to propel it be to 2030 and beyond because we all um, are all fixed on 2030, but we also have to take it beyond 2030. Um, entrepreneurship, a very important aspect where we seek to have more democratization in the sector. As you well know, the energy sector is highly, um, has a high level of monopoly involvement, and therefore we are trying to democratize the sector as we march towards 2030. The environment, we as a country that relies heavily on its environment, we want to ensure that, we that the sector contribute to the improvement of the environment and the sustainability of the environment. Of course, this all rests on a sound regulatory and legislative arrangement to move the sector forward. And of course, as Mark mentioned, innovation is also seen as a key aspect as we, as we Research and development is also um, identified as critical. Um, it, and this all shows us that what we need to do in the last aspect, which is fairly important, is economic enfranchisement. This is an opportunity to bring the average Barbadian along and to ensure that lives and livelihoods are positively impacted by the energy sector. Now, the economics of the energy sector. Now, we've envisioned as we were preparing the policy that it would cost uh, about four billion Barbados dollars to develop the energy sector. When you look at the production and distribution of energy, and of course, there are other surrounding elements like transport and so on um, that is also critical. Also, the key aspect or key economic benefit, as I mentioned earlier, um, is that we anticipate uh, reducing, eliminating, I should say, the, the energy bill to a level where on average is $4 million um, is the, the $4 million Barbados dollars is the, the fuel import bill and we've peaked, we've had that 800 there because that is the actual peak we had in the, in the um, 2014 and 2015, uh, where we went all the way up to 800 million Barbados dollars. So with renewable energy, the volatility in the sector, um, in terms of the cost of energy, we believe we can um, bring down substantially and even eliminate. Um, this all reads right down into our gross domestic product and as a consequence we are seeing uh, a benefit to the economy of Barbados in terms of 3.9 million billion dollars annually uh, because we are moving we are eliminating losses we are becoming more efficient and all of that reads directly into the economy and contributes to growth in a significant way so what does this actually mean um, how do we get there? Well, as we mentioned, this is an ambitious, an ambitious um, task that we have. And we want to move 49% by 2023 and reaching 100% by 2030. This would mean that we would have to bring in about 52% there's about of renewable energy by 2023 
and then marching onwards there. Um, this would mean you now that the key areas that we are focusing on would be wind, key technologies would be wind, onshore and offshore, and we've done considerable amount of work in the last year to prepare the, the Barbados environment for that. We've done a number of studies looking at offshore to see what the viability of that is. Of course, photovoltaics, which is leading the way right now, um, that is both on a centralized and distributive. Um, we expect that 80% of that will be on rooftops, depending on the technical constraints. And 20% of this would be on, on the ground. So land is a, um, a constant issue in this regard. Uh, with respect to biomass and waste to energy, those are areas that we expect to come on um, towards the mid to latter part. Um, although we are um, working right now with um, other players in the in the sector to um, on mass burn as well as bio biogas. Now the the mix and remember this mix is is going to be influenced by by the market and it is a living situation. So take this as a launch pad to move forward. Now we've seen that we, as I mentioned, we have solar, um, which is about 310 broken up by, in terms of centralized and de decentralized, 205 to 105 respectively megawatts that is. Um, onshore and offshore wind evenly distributed about 300 megawatts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, biomass and waste energy, we initially saw um, 15 megawatts here, but this may be changing because there's room, um, observed that there may be room for more biomass to come on stream. Of course, this cannot, we cannot move in a significant way to variable renewable energy without storage. And we envisage 132 um, megawatt central and 68 distributive. So our total mix right now, we've observed, um, is around 600, just over 600, 625 um, megawatts. Now, when we look at the current situation, so we see where we want to go and now we have to say, well, okay, where, what are we dealing with? And we have a significant um, amount of, of fossil fuel just over, um, 93% of the total energy um, is fossil fuel right now. Uh, we have a small slither of total energy moving towards renewable sugarcane, and so which is biomass, and we are seeking to move, uh, expand that. So if by 2030, we are hoping, or we intend, I should say, that this chart will look significantly different. And the major sectors, economic sectors, which would, um, which are critical to address, are of course, electricity generation, which consume a significant amount, over 54% of the fossil fuel transport sector is the next largest. And then the remainder is distributed among the industrial, residential, commercial, and construction sectors. Now, this is the picture that we, we are at right now, and how it looks with respect to the amount of electricity. You know, our average electricity consumption is just over 900 gigawatt hours, probably around 928 there's about. But if you look to the far end, the right end, if you're facing your screen, you will see that a drop has occurred and that drop was primarily as a result to as a result of what happened during COVID and its impact on the tourism sector. Indeed, 
the tourism sector uh, consumption dropped by about 45 percent meaning that the the average consum the the last amount of um the if you look at the the consumption over time the it the amount of electricity prior to 2030 2020 um was around 2027 and 127 sorry um gigawatt hours and as a result of covid um, it dropped all the way to 70 gigawatt hours. Right now, we have about 49 um, mega, megawatts on the grid. That's about 8% of electricity. We have a significant way to go. We have um, policy um, development, economic incentives, and technical arrangements, which we are going through right now. Um, you have heard announced recently where we are looking at putting a premium on the current on the current tariffs between one megawatt to five megawatts if investors come on board within the next nine to six months and implement over the next two years. Of course, uh, there are a number of incentives that have been introduced, um, mostly of a fiscal nature. Um, to aid the sector along. We, as I mentioned earlier, we've done considerable work in the area of um, in, in the area of wind and solar. We are also addressing our integrated resource plan, with, which will address such areas as resource need, resource needs constraints, storage, land, the land constraint. Um, looking at the grid and modernization of the grid and what it's going to cost to do that. And then also the looking at phasing out of the, the um, important um, generation that was once there. Now, the, I, am, I, think, I believe this is the last slide. Um, tariffs are currently in place up to 10 megawatts um, guaranteed for 20 years. There's a local content element in foreign investment where the government of Barbados is saying that uh, foreign investors have to um, make room for about 30% at minimum for local investors, and as well as the technology types. We mentioned that earlier. And then with respect to land, government is prepared to look at the dual nature of land. So for example, where renewable energy can work with agriculture, that is going to be encouraged, but we want to focus initially in terms of non-arable and subprime um, land space first, in particular around uh, solar, uh, centralized solar and large scale solar. Um, I want to bring it to a close here and thank you for your attention and I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. So next we are going to go over to Aidan Rogers. Uh, Aidan Rogers have been passionately involved in this renewable energy space um, for a number of years. Um, Aidan is currently attorney uh, at law for, uh, for 70 years in quality the bar. He's also the Vice President of the Barbados Renewable Energy Association, BRIA. Over the past nine years, he has participated in the Barbados Light and Powers Company Limited Integrated Resource Planning exercise, as well as serving as an interviewer, intervener, sorry, in the Trading Commission's consultations on the Renewable Energy Rider Pilot Program in 2013 and 2016. So, Aiden is a very, very important voice in this whole um, investment narrative. So I just want to encourage him to share with us right now um, how Bria sees this sector of holding. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks again to Invest Barbados for inviting me to participate in this session. Um, I think it's excellent to sensitize potential investors as to where we're heading in this sector. So I just really want to give you an overview this morning of who the Barbados Renewable Energy Association is. Then I'll spend a few minutes looking briefly at the renewable energy investment landscape that I think my colleague Brian from the ministry would have touched on. 
then I'm going to spend the balance of my time really focusing on a snapshot of renewable energy project development process in Barbados, which I think several of you who are potential investors would be keen, or developers would be keen to get some insights on. And obviously, this is a, just a brief overview of some of these issues, because obviously, time permitting, this is really just a segue to wider discussions as you explore your options of looking at Barbados as an investment domicile. So basically the Barbados Renewable Energy, we would have been established around 2011 and we're pretty much established as a non-governmental organization. You would see that our, 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 our moderator this morning, Mark Hill, he actually was one of the founding members of that association along with Mr. Joseph Kelman, Mr. Peter Gallup and Mr. Clyde Griffith. Clyde Griffith coincidentally was the island's first energy minister appointed way back almost 40 years ago in 1981. And essentially beer really is focused on everything concerned with sustainable energy development. Besides renewable energy, we also look at energy efficiency and energy conservation because as Mr. Haynes would have indicated before, if we can maximize on energy efficiency it would make our renewable targets a lot more achievable in a shorter time. Brea basically represents everything that has to do with renewable energy on the island. We were very integral over a decade ago in terms of pushing public education and research, pushing for the establishment of industry standards, whether it came to the quality, particularly for photovoltaic components that were involved, being introduced and imported into the island. We were heavily involved in the shaping of the legislative and regulatory policy we participated in the development of the current renewable energy legislation, the Electric Light and Power Act. We would have played an integral role as well with respect to the whole feeding tariff and the renewable energy rider programs that would have developed over the last decade. So everything that is pretty much representative of the renewable energy sector today in Barbados, if you approach the jurisdiction as an investor, Barbados Renewable Energy Association would have been involved. Our membership is quite varied. We have from institutional members such as the University of the West Indies, Williams Industries, who is a major renewable energy developer. We have small practitioners who focus on the distributive market. We also have the utility company who is here represented by Mr. Robert Hayward today, who are also members. So we represent a wide cross section of interest within the renewable energy sector. And we also have some local manufacturers as well who are members, particularly on the energy efficiency side as it relates to whether it's solar water heating systems, which have a long history in Barbados, or as it relates to LED lighting. And of course, we have in the transportation sector and Ms. Edgel, who has been one of our long-standing members since Megapower was established, is also a member of BREA. So everything that has to do with renewable energy, sustainable energy, Brea is the non-governmental organization that you would want to really engage in if you're looking at trying to navigate your path through Barbados as an investment choice in this sector. As it relates to the investment landscape, I think Mr. Haynes would have really introduced you to what are some of the key focal points, and that's basically the Barbados National Energy Policy. He would have given you some insight as to what is the protected potential capital investment opportunity over the next nine years as we look at this sector. We've seen that a lot of investment is really focused on renewable energy as it relates to onshore, offshore wind and distributive and utility scale solar to the 625 megawatts. As he indicated correctly, these targets are indicative. There obviously might be a lot more opportunity for investment particularly as we look at some more innovative solutions that would have to be tailored specifically to meet some of the technical needs of the grid. And I wouldn't preempt Mr. Harewood in speaking to some of those technical needs, but I guess some of you will be rec recognizing that Barbados is an island and island grids present unique challenges that what we would call continental or metropolitan grids that have some level of interconnection, cross-border interconnectivity um, we don't have. So we literally need to produce as much as we, as demand requires. And that requires a bit more nuance in terms of the technology options and solutions that you may want to 
introduced in Barbados. And that's why really early engagement is gonna be key, but I'll speak to that as I go on in my presentation a bit more. As it relates to storage, again, that's an indicative target. We have an ambitious target of 2030 by being 100% renewable. Obviously storage is gonna determine what that 100% means, whether it means partial 100% or full 100% where we have a redundant system that can stand on its own for maybe a day, two days. That would obviously determine those figures in terms of the wind and solar potential and always also the storage capacity. So as potential investors, developers, this is something that you should also look towards as an opportunity as you bring innovative solutions to the island to best see how you can meet some of these policy objectives and add some greater technical and investment clarity as to what you can provide for Barbados as a jurisdiction to make that 2030 vision a reality. So essentially, some special focus should be placed on innovative hybrid solutions that are specifically suited to offload some of our base load fossil fuel capacity, because essentially we would need to move to some sort of renewable base load capacity. We've looked at biomass as an option. There are limitations there with respect to the biomass load. So we're really looking to what are the core renewable energy technologies with respect to offering some viable solutions for us as a jurisdiction. The next issue that we'll focus on is really the project development process. And time wouldn't permit for me to get into that in detail, but as potential investors, as I said, I've been involved in the sector for a decade. I have the benefit of having some insight and so as several members in Bria. So you would really want to, on entering the jurisdiction to pretty much get a survey of what potential investment opportunities, you have to engage in selecting the right partners locally. And that can be a reliance on a cadre of professional skill sets. Attorneys like myself who are familiar with some of the legal and regulatory issues, particularly the issues as it relates to land securitization. You would need also to familiarize yourself with some of the engineering requirements as would emerge in the grid code. And Robert would probably speak to this a bit more. And also in terms of your design, because essentially the permitting process and how you navigate that process is gonna be largely hinged on where you can secure land on an island that's relatively small with competing interests in land usage and also where can you secure that land that meets the technical requirements with respect to the necessary infrastructure for you to internet interconnect onto the grid that in a cost effective manner so these are issues where you need to really focus on identifying the right partner and as brian indicated you also need to do that well considering creating a business model that can still satisfy local investment participation where required. But as I said, this is really just an introductory conversation so yeah. that you get a familiarization that there are persons that you can engage with in the jurisdiction who can assist you in navigating the various uh, matters that you need to address with to secure your investment here on island. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Ian, and that was very, very informative. So I'm gonna go straight to Robert Yearwood. Um, Robert Yearwood is an electrical engineer at the Barbados Light and Power with over 18 years experience. And this is the guy who really helps you to interconnect and to get your uh, project going. So, so what Robert has to say is very, very critical. So straight over to you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation, Mark. And thank you for Invest Barbados, giving me the chance to speak to everyone that's here. It's glad to see so many persons interested in renewable energy in Barbados. And it's, very, it's really an exciting time in Barbados for renewable energy. We've made some strides already, but there are a lot more to be made. So my job here is really just to show the utilities commitment to the 100% RE vision, not trying to get too technical as the engineer, as Mark might have said, but just really to show the background and, and where Leighton Power has come from and what we want to offer to, renew, to the renewable energy sector going forward. Right? So this is just a general slide to show where we were. You know, basically you can see at the top yesterday or a few years back, there was centralized generation. There's still some centralized generation and there was one where power flow 
as, as uh, Barbados Light and Power was the sole uh, producer in Barbados of, of electricity. And it was basically simple fixed pricing. And when we say passive customers, we mean that customers really didn't have the opportunity to generate electricity or influence how they use energy to, to some extent. Right? Uh, today, basically, we have a, a transition period where um, there's some variation in pricing. There's some time use pricing. There's some uh, still one way control from the utility. There's, dist there's distributed generation, which isn't really controlled by the utility either. And, and customers want a lot more information on, on what, how to use energy and uh, how they can make the best choices with regards to energy. And in the future, we would like to see that energy becomes almost like the internet where you know, the utility provides that web and there's a multi there are multiple flows of energy and you can have things like dynamic pricing and customers have the ability to decide how to use energy, right? In a bit more meaningful way, right? So this is what we expect in the future. The next slide basically just shows the strategy of Barbados Light and Power. So we see there the market opportunity and the drivers towards uh, being 100% renewable. So there's a demand really for cleaner, more affordable energy. Um, the regulatory standards and environmental regulations, the Paris Agreement, and then locally we've, we've agreed to a 100% renewable target by 2030. And um, there's also, a, a, well, as we say, a social and political demand for to be clean and to reduce fuel imports and diversify the, the sources of energy that we use and improve the stability and independence and move away from fossil fuels. So you can see there in yellow, the BLPC, the Barbados Light and Power Strategy. So we have a number of linkages to other companies. We also have um, assets that we're familiar with in the green space and experience that we can offer and the capabilities that we have from uh, managing the grid for over 100 years that we can offer to help this transition, right? So we can see that our focus is on clean energy, electrification, grid modernization, and maintaining the core utility business, right? So uh, strategically, what we look at every year is, is some of the items you see there on the core business, strategy, employee experience, customer experience, and operational excellence. And on the operational excellence, a lot of that is to do with um, improving our reliability and offer a better, offering a better service to customers. And on the growth, you can see there the 100% green energy, 100% clean energy, and electrification, 100% target, and creating the grid of the future, which is really a, a smarter grid. And we, we always had, uh, for many years, we had a, a target to be 100% renewable originally, uh, probably as far back as 2010, we might have said uh, we wanted to get to 100% by 2040 or 2045. It's 2045, I think it was. But um, since the, the government would have would have moved towards the target of 2030, we also would have aligned with that 2030 target to see if we can reach that 100% by 2030. So. So this slide shows the BLPC investment in RE to support the 100% vision. So these are some of the things we are doing to make the grid able to accept the renewables that we expect will be coming in the future, right? So we've implemented AMI, we've actually installed 122,000 meters um, so far on our AMI system, right? So this will help us to be able to understand how the energy flows and how we can make better decisions in terms of leveraging energy on the grid. Um, LED street lights, we've also installed 23,000, 23.5 thousand street lights. We've replaced all these street lights, basically almost all these street lights on the island is um, just maybe a few more to be done, but almost all are installed. And we've also looked to upgrade our substations. So every year we look at our aging assets and we seek to modernize some of those aging assets, right? And those that will be at end of life. So a lot of these substations, once we upgrade them, 
we try to make them ready for, for the RE that we expect in the future and offer more space for integration of renewables and the ability to manage to wear power flows and improve communication features and things like that, right? Um, so distribution, transmission and distribution expansion projects as well. Um, we also have on the cards to help to um, allow the grid to accept more power. And, and this is something, this is an ongoing process for us where we look at what we need to do on the grid. We've, we've done a number of studies that help to inform what this expansion profile is supposed to look like. And we usually would have a plan over five to 10 years to say how this expansion should take place. And, it, and, it, and we, we adjust this plan based on the conditions and the input from stakeholders as well that help us to make this plan better as we get closer to those timelines. Uh, partnerships and capacity building. So we do a number of workshops as well. We've done workshops historically to, to help persons to understand things like the grid code, renewable energy requirements. We've done media engagements as well. We have a radio show that we, we offer not just renewable um, feedback, but education on things uh, related to the utility as well. And we also have our, our business magazine. Uh, we, we also offer support to the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Energy. We've done a lot of collaboration in recent time with the Ministry of Energy. Um, and that has helped between, for the understanding between the, the two entities and, and allowing us to come to the same understanding technically on how um, grid expansion should occur, right? And we also have collaborations with NGOs such as Bria that um, Aidan would have spoken about. And he's also, that would have helped us to tailor some of the programs that we have and help with the processing of, of um, renewable applications, et cetera. All right, so the time use rates, we have some time use rates, but in the future, we, we probably would expand that as well. And we also have a program that also speaks to, um, this is the Customer Energy Savings Finance pro Financing Program. And this, this allows customers to even uh, finance renewable energy projects for homeowners uh, through bill financing, right? So this is something we have with the regulator right now currently to be approved. And there are other, other energy efficiency measures that we would have worked with um, various stakeholders to help to implement. We also leverage experiences from various affiliates that we have. We have our, our parent company also has the renewable 100% vision. And we have other companies on board as well that are doing similar things to us in installing renewable projects that would help us to have those learnings uh, for the betterment of Barbados. So these are some of the milestones that we, we would have had over the last 10 years. We've had the renewable energy writer in 2010. Grid code development started in 2013 and actually completed in 2017. The first EV purchase in 2013. We spoke about the AMI infrastructure, distributed automation. We have a GIS system as well that helps to, to uh, it helps us with our, our reliability programs right now, but we can leverage that a bit more to do other things related to renewable energy. We have a 10 megawatt solar PV farm and also a five megawatt battery. Right, and we focus as well on reliability and re resiliency on, on an annual basis and improving the flexibility of the grid. So, so this slide shows the growth so far of renewable energy to, uh, um, within our customer group. Uh, we also have the 10 megawatt plant, but it's not included in this graph. So you can see how it has grown over the years. You see the capacity peak in the recent years. In the last two years, the capacity grew a lot faster because of uh, five. 500 kilowatt and one megawatt connections to the grid, which were allowed only in the last two years, but we're going beyond that now, as Brian would have mentioned. But it shows the opportunity here as well on the left for a lot more benefits here. And these are a list of opportunities you can have here. The opportunities far outstripping the risk, but you know you must make sure that the management is right and we take the right approach to get these benefits. You don't want to have um, the the, you know, the outages that some other countries would have experienced by, by not managing the, the growth of RE in a sustainable manner, right? And here, this just speaks to preparing for the RE impacts. This is a bit more technical slide. So BLPC um, 
has done various great studies to inform the mitigation measures for RE that is coming. And the grid code was developed based on a lot of these studies and the collaboration the stakeholders and the regulatory policy would also have helped to um, make some changes and adaptations over the years that would have made it more efficient. And um, continuous grid measurements and modeling is important to make sure that we stay safe and reliable. Right. So, sorry, this slide here, basically Brian would have spoken to a lot of these from the energy policy in more detail than I did, than I would. Right, so it just speaks here to 205 megawatts of centralized solar for the energy policy, 105 megawatts of distributed solar, and 150 megawatts of onshore wind, 150 megawatts of offshore wind, and 15 megawatts of biomass, 200 megawatts of storage, which Brian would have also mentioned already. So thank you once more for having me, and I hope that um, this contribution would help you to decide and your approach to renewable energy in Barbados. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll go straight over to Joanna Edgel. Um, Joanna Edgel is the director of Megapower. And Megapower is, is seen as the Caribbean's leading electric vehicle and specialist garage. So I just want to introduce you to Joanna Edgel to just give us a very brief um, testimony of her experience so far. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you, Mark, and good morning to everyone in Barbados, and good morning and good afternoon to those of you joining us um, from the rest of the world. Megapower was established in 2013 by Simon Richards and myself. We are headquartered in Barbados, and we also have a permanent office in neighboring Antigua. Megapower focuses on promoting the uptake of electric vehicles powered by renewable sources. Over the last eight years, we've developed eight areas of the business. Um, so that's sale of electric vehicles, it's sale of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, it's running a publicly accessible charging network, it's maintenance of vehicles, it's battery reuse and also special projects. In the early days, we focused on the Nissan Leaf, recognizing that globally, Nissan had sold more electric vehicles than anyone else. We were a gray market importer, so importing lightly used vehicles into Barbados. And maybe it's noteworthy that in Barbados, you cannot import vehicles that are older than four years. Um, so we were importing vehicles one or two years old. However, we have really grown to become a specialist garage and we sell a range of plug-in and electric vehicles ranging from buses to um, cars to SUVs and to vans. This is a quick snapshot here of March 21. And I suppose one of the most notable things of last year um, was the expansion of the Barbados Transport Board to include initially 33 BYD K8RA electric buses. Um, and now that has grown to 35 with plans for further. So that was a really exciting development um, for Barbados, for the government, but also for Megapower. And we support these buses technically with technicians undertaking the, the maintenance. I suppose another notable thing of last year was the expansion of the business to include two distributorships. So one being BYD, um, the manufacturer of these buses, but also SEAT Group, another Chinese manufacturer who manufactured the MG ZS, which is a mid-sized SUV. So here today in Barbados on the road, there are more than 550 electric vehicles. And with the growth of the electric mobility sector and the expansion of these vehicles onto the driving landscape, training has become an important um, component of what our company does. Just showing you kind of the level of training that, that we undertake, and it really is a partnership. So, you know, it's working with the Institute of the Motor Industry, it's working with vehicle manufacturers, but it's also working with local organizations and indeed, especially the Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology, which is our 
Technical Vocational Training Institute here on the island. Um, it's also working with government and in Barbados we're very uniquely placed in that we have a very clear strategy, um, the clean energy policy from the Ministry of Energy, but also we have the support of the electric utility and then also multilateral agencies like the Inter-American Development Bank, which fund projects and pilots in Barbados and regionally. Here's, here's a photo of just some of the training, actually the top left photo um, is of Fortis TCI, which is the electric utility in Turks and Caicos. And I'm really showing you that to demonstrate that the work that Megapower does extends beyond Barbados um, throughout the region, and especially working closely with electric utilities. The bottom right is our battery reuse laboratory in Barbados. So um, acknowledging that, you know, what happens to that battery after year eight, year nine, especially with the older vehicles, we have um, developed a range of applications from um, repurposing battery packs into golf carts, also into street lights, and also indeed into my office that I'm sat here in Barbados, um, linked to a uh, solar photovoltaic system to power the energy needed, um, air conditioners, uh, fridge, etc. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So what did we do? Um, what would Churchill want us to have done? Uh, this is something that we ask constantly in here as we've had a couple lockdowns in Barbados. And one thing that we're very proud of is our new website, which is a lot more interactive than, than our last one. You can see instantly what do we have that's available for sale, both new and used. Um, and so that's an example of kind of what did we do last year? We also transitioned a lot of our marketing to online. We involved a couple media personalities here to take a vehicle for a week, blog about it, drive with it. So these are just some examples of how we're trying to be creative um, whilst running a business that is not a work from home business um, uh, over the last year. Charging partnerships. So in Barbados, you're never more than five kilometers from a public charging point. And this has involved partnerships with um, landlords, with property owners, with developers. And really I vision a Barbados where one in 10 car parking places are um, accessible or car parking spots, I should say, are accessible to EV charging. And I think that will then make a big difference. And we're not there yet, but we can be. Again, finance partnerships and linked to this as well as insurance partnerships. So it's looking at how do we structure financing um, to ensure that the customer buying the vehicle has the best possible purchase experience, but also experience of ownership. So in terms of the insurance companies looking at, hey, what happens if there is an accident? You know, please don't give our customers an old diesel banger, please put them in an electric vehicle. And looking at the charging infrastructure side and how insurance can play a role in the best electric mobility experience in Barbados and beyond for our customers. Um, really that's it, but I, I want my message today to be that Barbados is, even though our business is eight years old, it's still very much developing and there is so much opportunity for electric mobility. Um, Barbados, for example, does not have any car sharing applications. There are very few rental companies that will rent electric vehicles. And these are just a couple illustrations of where um, persons may invest and get involved. There's so much scope for electric mobility with a supportive environment of our government, the electric utility, organizations like BRIA, as well as um, other projects and programs where you can access financing in Barbados. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you very much, um, Joanna Edgel. That was a very, very informative um, presentation. Well, we have um, four minutes to the top of the hour, and um, we want to get into some questions and answers um, as quickly as possible. Well, many of the questions have been posted up in the chat, so I just want to give um, just a quick 30 second response um, from um, the panels, panelists to answer some of these key questions here. Um, for example, the one that is pitched to Aidan Rogers, 
to Aiden Rogers explain exactly what he means by differentiating partial 100 and full 100%, and also um, what's the plan to harden the power distribution infrastructure by burying cables. So I believe one is pitched at um, Aiden and one is pitched at um, Robert, and then we can move on from here. And we will have an extra five minutes um, for our uh, event today. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks again for that question. I actually just sent a detailed response, but I'll just spend a minute explaining. The question of full versus partial 100% is more technical question as it relates to the fact that the majority of our identified generating capacity is intermittent, which means that if we want to run a 100% system, we will want to know how much redundancy there is. And for persons who are familiar with off-grid or battery backup systems, you pretty much try to design a system that can meet either your present or anticipated future load. So basically you have to oversize the system. And that question from a policy perspective, I don't think we fully answered it yet because a country is not a home that is being off-grid. A country is something that is dynamic investment opportunities emerge, new developers come in, you may have new hotels come on board. And also by virtue of the fact that we live in the hurricane belt. So the question of 100%, does it mean we want to have a system that has enough capacity stored to give us a 24 hour backup capability? Is it a 48 hour capability in the event that there's a catastrophic hurricane that takes out a lot of our capacity? So that question of full versus partial is really nuance in terms of what the final system design for a 100% system, electricity generation system would look like by 2030. Because we're moving from a scenario where we would have installed capacity based on fossil fuel assets. And then once we have enough fuel, we can know how long that fuel can run those assets. So the similar approach will have to be taken with a renewable energy system. How much capacity do you have to meet the needs of the system in terms of power demand? And that's really a feature of how the system is designed. Excellent. So, Robert, um, over to you. And there's also a question, Robert, if you can actually inform the entire panel. Uh, what, what do you mean by AMI as well, in, in addition to the question that was answered before about hardening the infrastructure? Yeah. All right. So, all right, to first do the hardening question. Um, we would have... Well, our, our backbone, the backbone of our network is, I would say, over 90% undergrounded already. So generally, this is what we rely on, uh, typically because we are in the hurricane belt. And by design, the way that we have made our system is such that um, in, the, in the event of a natural disaster, typically the lines are supposed to really break away from the poles. Um, on the distribution network, um, so that it's easy for us to replace them, right? So we understand that there may be some loss for a short while, but um, in the event of a natural disaster, you want to be able to get the system back up as quickly as possible. So the main transmission infrastructures, generally, I would say over 90% undergrounded, right? And um, our substations are also, our high voltage substations are also indoor high voltage substations. We also, we have one that's outdoor still, and. We, we have that in train to put indoors within the next year or two, right? Really, well, within the next year and a half, basically. So so pretty much from, from the backbone perspective, uh, the system should be pretty secure. Um, it would just be on the distribution network. So you expect that the major gener generation sources would be, would be covered um, for the island once we get to install the larger systems that would be grid connected. AMI, AMI is the advanced metering infrastructure and AMI is uh, supposed to help us to leverage um, in, in enabling the ability to have a smart grid. So AMI allows the meters to basically, we have communication from the meter level. So we have uh, regular updates on the energy use in each household in Barbados and the communication comes right back to our control room at, in, um, in our offices at the garrison. And um, it, we're still building out and still leveraging the, 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 the efficiencies that you can get from an AMI system. But there's several efficiencies you can get there 
with regards to maybe monitoring outages, you know, typically in the past, we would rely on customers to report outages, but in the future, maybe you could be able to see those even before the customer maybe acknowledges that there's an outage, but things like that, and as well as being able to understand the renewable clusters on the island and being able to understand how um, different sections of the grid are affected by those um, renewable systems and when they when they um, they actually uh, impacted by weather and things like that, right? So, so the system allows that capability along with other systems that we also have implemented. So that's just one part of the communica communications infrastructure that will help us to control the energy on the grid. Okay, thank you very much. So we have reached our time and we are going to um, really ask the folks and who joined us this morning to send us those questions and we will continue to answer them um, either via email or some other format. But um, there's some still, still a lot of issues to drill down into concerning this particular industry. Um, for example, what are the feeding tariff rates right now? Well, what I can say is that they're very, very attractive. So before we go, I just wanna know if there's any closing words by Kay Brathwick, the CEO of uh, Invest Barbados and let her have the final say. And we wanna thank all of you for joining us this morning and God bless you. Over to you, Kay Brathwick. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for everyone in attendance. Um, I was very um, happy to see all the interest and all the questions that are coming through, and I agree with you, Mark. Just send us all of those questions, and we will have the questions answered, and we will direct you to the relevant persons who are the experts in those particular fields related to any the questions that your queries. But Thank you very much from all of the interest we've seen, seen here today. Mark, we may have to have a part two of this webinar and uh, we will engage you, don't, matter, don't mind that you are switching roles, but we will still engage you because you have done a wonderful moderator. And thank you to all of the speakers and you, the par participants, as we move forward, we, we, we can only use your questions, your queries and your guidance to make the whole renewable energy sector um, better in Barbados as we strive to reach that goal at 2030. So that's it for me, Mark. And again, have a wonderful day, everyone.